<laughs> well, thank you. Thank you, everybody, for joining in, and thanks for uh, our uh, integrators uh, to uh, and uh, and our distributor to give you guys the opportunity to share a little bit of what we're doing right now. This is going to be a quick flyby, so uh, just get your seatbelts on, and we'll we'll run through all this information because there's a lot of cool stuff for you guys. I think the the more important part, and also running through the deck, there's a little bit of uh, video content here as well is the fact that if you think about the theme for, for us, for the communication driver portfolio in 2020, I would call it uh, extending our reach. Uh, if you have been using our communications driver portfolio, you may be aware that we have actually a very rich set of drivers uh, for PLCs, but little by little, we have been expanding what we call our reach of our communications into other areas like IoT to MQTT. We're gonna talk about the cool stuff that we're doing in that area uh, in these uh, uh, re new releases, as well as treating web services the same way we treat PLCs. So that's actually a very interesting part of our communications, whether, for example, we can bring in weather data and integrate it seamlessly into our portfolio offerings, such as System Platform, InTouch, and others. And also, I'll talk a little bit uh, about a new offering in the telemetry area, if you are in one of those uh, industry verticals that deal with that. So a lot of cool stuff. Now, things that you may not know about our communication strategy, which I want to highlight here, is the different capabilities that you have throughout as it relates to, let's call it uptime. Uh, so I'll walk through this. As an example, uh, when you uh, use, let's say, InTouch or System Platform or Historia, you do the traditional connectivity to the PLCs, you use our communications drivers. So that's what I call the, the first phase of communication. But then, we actually have built in into our driver suite uh, redundant communication to those PLCs. So that if the PLCs support high availability or dual drivers, we actually have a good uh, set of connectivity very fast, which automatically detects uh, if there's any issues with the connectivity between the driver and the PLC. So this is what we call uh, network path PLC redundancy. Then as you mature with your application, you start leveraging system platform because you start consolidating applications and use system platform as that middleware, use application server as that middleware where you define your objects and what they do and then link them to things like the visualization area through InTouch and OMI or system platform or MES or others. But once you start integrating into system platform, you start building more high availability because of the distributed nature of system platform. Where here you can also see that you can have redundancy at the communications uh, driver level leveraging the redundant concept of system platform. And then system platform in itself can be highly available through the concept of redundant engines. And moving forward, the driver concept that we have in our professional edition of the drivers, the multi-instance make even those connectivities to the device drivers even more robust with the power of multi-instance where you divide those up. And last but not least uh, is the usage of virtualization in the, in the schema. So obviously very powerful end-to-end -end, uh, high availability and integration into the, uh, into the platform. Uh, moving forward as well, I wanted to highlight this real quick. It's nothing new, but some of you are starting to move, uh, let's say from uh, migrating from either the 2012 system platform or older system into the latest and greatest, whether it's 2017 or 2020. So I make sure that you're aware of auto build and what it does. And it's available for platforms that are common to most of you, which are Alan Bradley and Siemens. And basically, I'll run through a video here that uh, walks through auto build. Uh, when we create the communication with our uh, OI server into the PLC, we actually know the entire structure of that PLC. And this is very uh, obviously with the Siemens driver and the Logix drivers that are hierarchical in nature. We know all that hierarchy. So why not leverage that information from the PLC to create the templates and the instances in application server automatically so you don't have to do that work manually. And if you're not familiar with system platform, actually this is a great teaching tool because it automatically builds a structure for you and then you learn the best practices of how to create that integration. So as you can see, we just run that first part of the auto build process and we come here into system platform and see that all that all those templates have been automatically created for us, ready to use. Now, 
In this particular video, what I want to do is also highlight a new feature that was introduced in System Platform 2017, which is the concept of object wizards. Now, in this concept, we can actually create templates with options. Uh, so here I'm using uh, the example to create a concentrator set and a transfer set that will become optional equipment. What this means is that not all equipment in the field may have those options. So as you create those instances, you can turn some of those options on and off. So now we'll run the auto build process again, select those instances from the PLC and uh, run through the uh, building process. You can see that it's a very, very simple workflow. So you can actually start playing with it uh, to, again, to learn the power of it. And uh, uh, sure enough, once you bring those in instances into your application, now they have the capabilities of object wizards where now you can select those options into the PLCs and you don't have to have a very rich set of attributes going into runtime that perhaps you're not using. So just key capability that again, the system platform 2017 and 2020 are available, auto build. Uh, so if, if you were not aware of it, you can talk to uh, Mike and uh, Kelly and Tim to get more information on that. Uh, moving forward now, let's switch over to what we have in 20, no, for 2020. Remember that this, the theme of 2020 is expanding our reach and OPC UA is becoming part of that. We have already OPC UA client tools in our portfolio. And um, one of the things that I wanna make sure that you uh, are aware of uh, right now that we did in our portfolio in 2017 update three is the introduction of secure communication between our portfolio. Security has become more and more important. So our traditional connections are built in native connections like SuiteLink, MS, MX, and iData, which are part of system platform, are now secured uh, since 2017 Now, in, in terms of adding the OPC UA server capabilities to our portfolio, we took a, a bit of a different approach. Instead of making it separate by product, we built it into our platform itself. That way, any component in our, in our portfolio can become an OPC UA server. There is, there is work for each product to do to become an OPC UA server. Um, the first one in the list to uh, have done this is uh, App Server. And um, so we added secure connectivity and exposing the data from App Server. Let's take a quick look at an example here of uh, what we have done with OPC UA server. I'm actually using a third party tool here, OPC Expert, which is kind of neat. Uh, it's an OPC UA client. So what we have done here is connect to application server that has been enabled to be an OPC UA server. And you notice here that I am, I'm actually browsing the app server namespace. OPC Expert uh, then has some plugins into Excel. There is, you know, it's a simple uh, tool. Uh, it has some neat capabilities. So you can just drag and drop the data into Excel and start pulling data in there. Um, it's a simple example, but it shows you the capability of extracting data from system platform, perhaps if you're outside that operations um, section of the plant, and you, you may be more in the business side of the plant instead of being in the, uh, that part of the plant. So OPC UA server available with application server, and we'll add, be adding more uh, as we move along. <clears throat> Let's now speak about telemetry. Now, telemetry is something that has existed in our industry for many years. We just haven't had internally a driver suite for telemetry. If you work in some of these areas, you will recognize what I'm talking about. Let's say power distribution, water, wastewater, or oil and gas midstream. Uh, there's some, some typical standards that are used in this industry to transmit the data from those geographical locations into our system. So you always want to bring the data uh, in into your SCADA system for monitoring and control purposes. Uh, the protocols of DMP3 and Modbus have been uh, very typical standards in this industry. And in Europe, one of those protocols is the IEC, IEC 60870. Very similar to the DMP3 protocol, but uh, they just use geographically in different places. Last year, we actually introduced the te telemetry server uh, portfolio into our market. Uh, we actually adapted uh, the components from some of the, uh, one of the other uh, uh, portfolio offerings and made it a, a driver suite. Extremely mature, although it's new for our market, it has been in, the, uh, in our industry for many years. So as you can see, it has many, many capabilities, very powerful. 
I want to uh, show you here very quickly some highlights of what is the difference be between a traditional connectivity? Why am I differentiating telemetry from uh, what we call the supervisory connections, which are OI servers? Uh, supervisory connections, think about connection to a PLC. They're expected to be connected all the time and talking very fast to the PLCs. On the other hand, telemetry server connections are intermittent. They're long networks, geographically distributed, hundreds or thousands of uh, miles. So the OI server is expected to be light data, whereas the telemetry server is mostly expected to be what we call late data. It'll come at some point later. OI servers give you continuous data and telemetry server will package the data, which it stores in the remote terminal units, the RTUs, buffers it and sends that packet to the software to be processed. And obviously the connectivity on one is connected all the time, where the, as the other one is expected to be disconnected. And telemetry typically has to use scheduling to take advantage of those low bandwidth architectures. Now, since this is new, what we have done actually as part of the delivery of the software, we have created starter sample projects. So I'm showing you here that it doesn't matter the uh, protocols that you pick, we actually created those sample starter projects for you. So you can get a template uh, and they have, if, if we were to drill down through the whole suite, the whole set of uh, uh, objects that represent the devices in the field, depending on the connectivity that you're using, whether it's uh, connected, radio, or uh, uh, serial. All right. Uh, and the other part that I'm gonna show here is telemetry server, we're leveraging the natural connectivity of system platform. So quick example uh, uh, how I'm connecting one of the IEC devices using telemetry server, using uh, monitoring here in an analog and a discrete point. We're monitoring the values live. And then we can show in system platform, in this case, in object viewer, how the data is coming in. Now, important part here to mention is that um, Telemetry server has also uh, other capabilities such as, as integrated to system platforms. So I don't have to use the traditional DI objects for those. It's just naturally integrated. Very simple syntax. You, you already have, are used to some of the syntax, which is the device, the group, and then the alias. So not much of that changes. I'll skip through some of this, which is a lot of information in very little time. And, um, Letting you also know that in our GCS site, if you go and take a look at telemetry server, we have the entire online documentation there. So you don't have to download and install the product. You can actually see all the uh, help docs in it for uh, the entire product set. Very important part of this protocol as well is the lossless capabilities of uh, both TMP3 and IC60870. Uh, and so we actually delivered this as a redundant pair almost identical to system platform. So let's walk through that real quick. In system platform, you can have your platform and set of engines that are, uh, you have the main and the backups. And so you have a traditional communication path. If the engine goes down, it fall, fails over to the uh, backup pair and that one becomes active. Exactly the same thing with telemetry server. If a, if a main uh, driver goes down, it'll back up to the uh, standby machine and so this guarantees the uptime of your application. Let's take a quick look at an example here of how that would work. So I have set up telemetry server here as a redundant pair. Node one is the primary node. Node one is the secondary node. I'm monitoring my tags. And by the way, what I configure in node, in node one automatically gets duplicated into node two. I am running my application and I'm monitoring uh, the tags in uh, system platform we're displaying here in object viewer. Now you'll see here in a second that uh, the data is coming into a historian and we're visualizing it through the historian client. And so here the data coming in. Now what we're gonna do is we're actually gonna shut down the main node. And you'll see here on the right hand side of the bottom of the screen that we're gonna shut down that guy, uh, let's say for maintenance purposes. Now, because of the nature of DMP3 and IEC, as well as telemetry server, it buffers the data uh, internally. So we will not lose data. You saw the, here that the, the tags are bad. The historian client flattened out because it's not receiving any new data anymore. And now the communication was reestablished by uh, the, the second very node coming up. Now we would expect there to be lost data loss here, but by the power of telemetry server, 
uh, you see here that we didn't lose any data in this uh, fallback. So very important part of the strategy with the, these drivers, especially in those industries that require support for this. So moving forward, uh, in some of the more uh, elaborate architectures, there's what we call the master-slave architectures, where in typical cases, telemetry server is communicating directly to those remote terminal units in the field, and then to the devices themselves, bringing the data into system platform. In much larger applications, applications there's actually this tiering concept where at the bottom, uh, there can be multiple levels where the telemetry server is acting as a master to the remote terminal units and then also as a slave into another master. So this is more for things like this, where I'm showing here the city of Rome and within the city of Rome there's uh, districts and with the districts there's regions. So you can have local control rooms, regional and central. So very powerful set of uh, uh, functionality. Also the concept of templatization as we have in system platform. And uh, I'll put this here for you. You can get the information later on as you can uh, slow the dig, dig through it, but a lot of rich capabilities in those uh, telemetry uh, driven protocols. Uh, very important as well is we have created a, a specific uh, YouTube playlist in our channel dedicated to telemetry server with really short videos, as you can see here in the screen, which are topical in nature and will help you uh, get going through your application so you're not uh, left alone as, as this is uh, new to a lot of you. All right, I'm blazing through all this information. Now we will jump out through the uh, IoT segment, which is uh, in our particular case, let's focus on MQTT. We have had an MQTT offering in our market for a while now, but we're strengthening that market in several areas, uh, strengthening that offering in, in several areas. Uh, one of them being the uh, specification uh, from the Eclipse Foundation, you may also have heard about this specification called Sparkplug. This is really the industrial specification of MQTT. The goal here is really to standardize the usage in industrial environments so that everybody, every, every vendor in the industry can understand uh, automatically anything uh, related to that. So let's take an example here of uh, a wind, uh, wind turbine, right? The wind turbine out in the field, there can be thousands of them. They're gonna be connected and collecting data locally to some either transmitters or PLC RTUs. In this particular case, we want to use a gateway, a data concentrator to connect to that turbine. In this case, we're using Aviva Edge. And then we want to bring that information to system platform via the MQTT protocol. So specifically, we want to make sure that we're uh, supporting the Spark Plug B specification of that protocol now. Now, this is the single unit. What about when you have all these units geographically distributed, hundreds or thousands of them? So again, you can use our portfolio using our edge management uh, capabilities, create the templates for those Aviva edge applications, uh, which you may have seen or will see in another presentation, and those templates get deployed to those individual units. Now, by the power of MQTT, uh, those units become publisher of this industrial network and start sending the data to us. Very efficient. Let me give you a quick breakdown of this, a little bit of what that means to be the industrial architecture of MQTT. At the bottom is the layer that's called the edge of network EON devices. They may be MQTT smart, but in, in a lot of cases, they're just gonna be either sensor devices or POCs that don't speak MQTT. So then there's a second layer called the edge of the network, EON node, which acts as a gateway. So it talks the local protocols to the devices at the bottom, but then to the top, it will be a publisher into the MQTT network, right? Although it's bi-directional, it's considered to be the starter of the data into the network. And obviously on the top side, there's gonna be something called the clients. Now in the industrial MQTT specification, there's something called the primary host application or the primary application. Traditionally, system platform in touch and our software will act as the primary host application via our MQTT driver, which is what we're actually introducing. So again, a few objectives of the specification are number one, they want to standardize on the namespace. So when you connect to an MQTT network, everything is consistent. So you can see here that uh, looking a little bit about what a topology of an MQTT reference syntax would look like, is always divided into three areas. The group, 
that edge of network node and the edge of network device, those two that we described. That's how it should look always. In addition to that, there's the concept of the payload. In other words, all the data that describes that device, that uh, field device. And in the industrial specification, there's an industrial for the payload. So those two pictures that you see here are actually part of our new uh, MQTT communications driver that completely understands the Sparkplug specification and automatically distills that for you. So if you think about it, the use case that we used for telemetry uh, a few minutes ago, uh, you can actually, and some customers are actually starting to modernize their infrastructure to use MQTT in lieu of the more traditional protocols. But if you expand from other areas where you think, where is this useful? Smart city applications, uh, plant globalization, where you want to take the, the information and centralize it into a unified operation center. Uh, if you're an OEM and you deliver machines to your customers, you can use this technology to monitor the health of those uh, the, the equipment that has been delivered. Well, let's take a little bit of a look at the end-to-end use case of what we call our Aviva Edge to Enterprise use case. We start with our Aviva Edge, as I showed in one of the pictures before. We created a connection to one of our Modbus devices, let's say a Modbus PLC. You create the data sheets to connect to the Modbus PLC. And then you can create a virtual representation of those devices in the field for the purpose of MQTT. So I create my data sheets using Aviva Edge. And you can see here that I have two well fields. A critical part of MQTT and a very important part is that it does report by exception only. So that means that in MQTT, you don't have to pull the field devices. It, it, you only send the data to the broker when the data changes. Extremely powerful concept of MQTT. On the other side of the broker, which is the broker is just middleware to pass the data through. Here we have our communications uh, driver, our MQTT OI server. And you notice that I'm showing a geolocation-based browser. So if those field devices support geolocation, and for us, it's actually very simple parameters of latitude and longitude, we can show those devices in the map, and we can browse the content of the, of the payload, or we can browse it in a hierarchical fashion, see all that information on the right-hand side. Now, this makes for a very simple and uh, powerful integration with system platform, because again, it's based on that hierarchical concept. So those groups and edge of network nodes become represented devices in system platforms such as areas, engine, device integration objects and, uh, and objects themselves. Um, and because again, that MQTT payload is standard, we can automatically, automatically distill the information that comes from those packages to create a very powerful integration with system platform. Then adding the concept of object wizards that I mentioned earlier, once you start building your very robust applications, you can add the graphics capability. So as the devices get added to your implementation, you don't have to do too much work or any work at all to bring it into your, into your uh, graphics and OMI. So that's the concept of edge to enterprise, as you can see, very powerful and uh, very seamless. And just to wrap it up, uh, I think we're doing uh, good on time. Uh, let me walk you through, through, through the commercial offerings. Our communications drivers uh, sometimes are packaged uh, with uh, other part of our offerings, but you can also get them standalone. Um, we actually have the concept of unlicensed where you have very, very small applications, uh, really less than 32 tags, but in the case of uh, IoT, for example, uh, you may want to bring that information into system platform. So we don't want to make it cost prohibitive. So if, you, if your application is a small IoT device, let up to 32 tags, uh, it's unlicensed. Um, so just keep that in mind. Then we have the standard license offering, which is our traditional single node offering, all the drivers there. There's no, there's no re real limits per driver, no tag limits. It's just you, ha you have the capability to use all our drivers in our suite there. Then moving on to the professional license, this is where we have added a, a few of the functional capabilities to the suite. Uh, which includes uh, the concept of multi-instance, which now you're dividing all those connections from a single driver into unique connections for the purpose of uh, stability, performance, and robustness, as well as the multi-version, which is, uh, helps you transition from older versions. And last but not least, the concept of auto-build that requires a professional license. 
And uh, the, the premier offering is really the telemetry server offering, which includes the professional uh, offerings in themselves, um, as well as the telemetry server stack. And this uh, premier license is actually redundant by nature. So you get actually two licenses into one. All right, so that was my uh, quick run through of uh, the, few the few things that are we doing in uh, 2020 here.